Oh, Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your word and that we can read your word and learn about your word. And so, Father, as we go through this tonight, if there are are questions that the people will be brave enough to ask them, Lord, and that you'll speak and we'll hear you through me, and not me, that we'll hear you through me. And we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, and I thank you, Father God, that you will quicken me, and not, I won't be concerned because the Holy Spirit will give me the direction as needed. We thank you, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. So, again, if you have questions, you can write them out and then... Okay, they're on the back tables if you want to go there. Of course, if you wanted to stay anonymous, then that's probably not going to manifest. All right? So, um, and I probably won't be able to get to all of them. Well, this is a very honest question. First one here is... Why are we so fearful about the times we live in when we know Christ will return and take us home? Well, I think the reason we are fearful is because we don't trust him. I think we just don't trust him enough to believe the right way. And uh, we're, we're human and we have free will, so uh, this is what we have to renew our mind to doesn't give us a spirit of fear. He gives us a spirit of faith. He speaks through faith, but, but I know. <coughs> and so it's a process. It's a growing process. Like, we grow as babies and a ch child and then to young adults and then to adults. That same process needs to be exercised to battle faith and fear. There's always this battle of faith and fear. So part of it is don't, don't get down on yourself if you're not maybe living as faithfully as you should. And also, you kind of got to pick yourself up when you are bowing your knee to fear more than faith. Now, a way that we get better at this is to not run from things. The, the only way to actually yourself. Now, now, you may be used to attaching yourself to somebody or some entity that lives by faith and boldly and courageously, and then you grab your hold of that and you say, I'm a part of that. That's, that's okay. That's normal. We, we build that, families, churches, organizations. But individually, like, we all are individuals, and we each have our own individual development. And so, you know, this is something that we are all daily get to exercise. And so that's the real, I think, takeaway we should receive from God on this, is you each have an opportunity to get back in the game of life. Life is hard. It's hard. It's got a lot of disappointments, a lot of just really rough things going on with life. And I guess a lot of us would like to just, like, check out. And at times we do with various instruments. I'm talking about drugs, alcohol. There's a lot of ways we check out from a reality of life that is hard. But in God's infinite wisdom, He's given us a choice. I mean, it, it may not make sense to us, but in it... it He's made it, in his wisdom, it's determined that it was better to have the opportunity to do evil than to have just good. For some reason, his, his way of doing it, it's better if you can experience evil or tyranny or just terrible things so that you actually know what good is. And then when you know what good is, you need to be able to rise up and press down the evil. Hmm. So I think part of that question of, you know, why do we remain fearful is because a lot of us don't want to, well, we, we read a book here as the church and did a book study called Chase the Lion Into a Pit on a Snowy Day. Benaiah did that. There's a guy in the Bible that just has a couple of lines, but he was the mighty man of David. 
he ended up being David's security guard. <laughs> Wouldn't you want a security guard like that that wasn't afraid to go kill a lion in a pit on a snowy day? That's an oxymoron. How many of us would chase a lion into a pit to kill it? We'd go the other way. Now, I'm not encouraging you to go chase lions like that right now. What I'm getting you to understand is maybe you should start it with a cat and work your way up. That's what this is all about. Okay? So, great question. Oh, this is another wonderful question. It's a very real one. We all experience this. This is the question. In, in death, if, if death is not the end, why do Christians cry and are sometimes consumed by sadness when loved ones pass away? Well, because we have feelings and we care. And it's okay to mourn. In fact, the Bible encourages it. In fact, it's really unhealthy to not deal with the reality of death because it will actually hurt you. It'll hurt you on the inside, your, your insides, the organs and stuff, if you, if you don't deal with that. So let it out, in other words. Let it out when it's called mourning, and it's a part of us. We all will die, in the, and our flesh returns, but our spirit and soul will live forever, and we'll actually get new bodies, praise the Lord. So, but that's why, and people do this, so I don't think we should, like, even approach anybody. We should comfort them, uh, and all of us do it differently, but, but the Bible talks specifically about there is a time to mourn, and... and that is usually when somebody we love has died. In fact, if you know anything about the patriarchs, when they died, they'd mourn for like 30 days. They'd have specific mourn, and then they'd be done, and they moved on. Okay, but, and that's kind of how we should do it. And then, you know, we may have great memories and get together as a family. But yeah, great question. And uh, I, hope, I hope that's, you know, encouraging you. Okay, wonderful question. The question is, how do we actively interact with the youth to teach them about God while also dealing with the current state of the world? How do we let them form their own opinion without oppressing their thoughts? Okay, well, this is an everyday occurrence for parents, for our culture. Teachers, well... There has to be a baseline that you can teach them about while also encouraging them because they don't know. They have to be able to express things. So for each of us, it's really important that we know what our own baseline is. We need to know what, where our boundaries are. We need to know this, the Word of God because that's where their confusion is and they want to know right and wrong. They... When, when we're young, I don't think we forget this as we age, but when we're younger, we are able to smell a lie quicker. We're a, in other words, we're able to tell if an authority figure is not telling us facts or the truth or is uncomfortable about telling us something. And then as a young person, what do we do? We push the envelope as much as we can without getting in trouble, or even sometimes we want to get in trouble. And so if we suppress as the people that are supposed to have the knowledge, and we don't, and we give them a false answer, that doesn't do them any good. And, and maybe the very person they're looking for the answer is us, or the, you know, Christians, the church, They'll find an answer somewhere else. They'll fill in the gap. And you all know what I'm talking about. If you, if you, God knows what's going on in your life. We've all done that as we've developed and are developing. So it really is on us, uh, each individual, each parent, grandparents, authority figures, to know the Word of God to be able to tell them. And here's, here's what I ask 
all of us. If you don't know and are unclear, tell them. Tell, just tell them, like, I'm not really sure about that one. I know that's talked about in the Bible. I don't understand that myself, or I haven't gotten the research. And in that process, you know what you're doing? You're keeping the door open that they know that you're not going to deceive them. That's really critical in our culture with all the social media, all the kids mainly have access to it. So there's an availability to answer every question. It's just that many of the, quest, many of the answers might not line up with the right answer. So it kind of behooves us to make sure we have done some due diligence in our research or that we're confident enough in knowing what the Word of God says to tell them the answer while continuing to encourage them to ask it the way they think it should be asked. It's kind of like, it's kind of like you just keep giving them a little bit more room and you got to be, but you got to have a boundary that when they cross it, you got to talk to them about like, that's gone too far. I hope that's making sense. Where does the Bible rank in importance? It's number one. That's easy. All right. Do you think today's church has fallen too far from the gospel we won't ever be able to recover? Well, I think every generation has asked this. I just read an article this morning that was written in the 1890s that I would have swore was written today. I'm not joking. I, I was shocked. I'm reading it. It was from a guy I never heard of, and he was a preacher in uh, England. And he was writing it about culture then, in the 1890s, and it sounded like it was for today. Um, no, I don't think we'll ever, we'll ever be at that spot, because all throughout Scripture, we see this happening. If you, if you know your Bible, there's a lot of times the Jewish people got pretty high on themselves. They forget God. They make some awful decisions, awful things they do, um, even to a point of being captured and put in captivity as slaves as in a nation for 70 years. So, you know, I think, I think more than anything, what we should be doing is being humble and getting on our knees and going, there's work to be done. There's work to be done. And if you just, if each one of us individually look in the mirror and deal with that work, we'll really be doing the best work we can do. If we really deal with ourselves, okay, that's, and see, there's a, there's a slew of, of Christians that will say they don't ever want to deal with things because Jesus is coming back. I'm not one of those. I'm like this. I'm here today, and he said I have today, and do the best you can with today. And don't worry about tomorrow. Don't be concerned about tomorrow. That doesn't mean you don't plan, but it means you have no guarantee there will be a tomorrow. You only have the guarantee of today. And so, what are you doing with that? And, and okay, then, then, you know, we'll hit the hay, get a little rest. We'll come up. Hallelujah, new cycle. We get to deal with that then. And, and so I want to encourage us to, you know, continue to improve ourselves. There's a lot on our plates. A lot on our plates. You've got to prioritize, right? That's why Bible's number one. And so that's where we go to get our information. How close are we to seeing Jesus return? <laughs> well, Scripture says, Scripture says we don't know the time of his return. Again, it kind of goes with my last one about, like, if that's what we're concerned about. In fact, I think, I think we received a call this week, Pastor Rihanna was telling me, is, uh, it's a good question, you know, 
where does freedom destiny stand with the rapture? I believe in the rapture. But I believe about, I'm here today, so I want to make sure that I'm empowering you today to do everything you can with the gifts God gave you so that you're making a change today. And don't be concerned about that because we don't know the date or the time. We know the seasons. We kind of believe here uh, that the full, five, seven seasons, seven festivals of God are very important. They're shadows. They're precursors to real events. The first three spring festivals were a precursor to uh, Jesus' you know, crucifixion and resurrection. And then the Holy Spirit comes on the Feast of Shavuot, Pentecost, that we celebrated here a month ago. And in the fall comes the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles, where he tabernacles with us. So I kind of believe that that season is when the return of the Lord will come because the scriptures say there's going to be a trumpet blast announcing the arrival. <laughs> okay? And he's going to arrive, Day of Atonement, and we're going to tabernacle with him. So uh, that's why, you know, we kind of teach that. So I don't really focus on, again, on when Jesus is going to return. He says he's going to return. That should be good enough for me. So I'm not going to honker down and do nothing and wait. I'm going to do everything I can with what I have to make an impact in our world today and, and do the same by, you know, our vision here is to encounter God, embrace families, and equip disciples. So... All these things we're doing is to equip you all. Like we've got a very practical equipping class coming up that's starting next Thursday. Financial peace. Man, all of the books of Paul, he pretty much started with a greeting or a, uh, you know, a sal he's, when he leaves the book, he's writing about peace and grace be upon you. So I know a lot of us want peace. And financial peace is a huge part of all our lives. So if you want to have some peace and you don't have some peace in that area, please come to the class. This is part of the thing I'm talking about. Do you want to equip yourself to, be, to do all you can in the community? Well, I can tell you what. If you don't have a lot, you can't give a lot. But if you have a lot, you can give a lot. And it's a process. It's a process. And it doesn't mean you're not worthy if you don't have a lot or you're more worthy if you have a lot. No, the way God does it he does it based on what do you do with what you have. So there you go. So if you want something about, to receive something about peace financially, please come to the class. Please come to the, oh, thanks. Oh, I'm good, Johnny. I have one over here. Thank you, sir. Thanks, buddy. You did your job, though, and you did it good. Um... Answered that. Okay, so here's a question. Um, I would like to know if I'm doing good for my church and will, and for God, even if I fail. I think I think a lot of people feel that way. I know I fail. Anybody else fail? <laughs> there you go. I heard somebody say daily. I think that was being kind. I think, I think I, I could say a lot of times I probably fail hourly. I mean, you might not believe that, but I think, I think we fail a lot more than we realize. So we are very grateful for the grace of God. It's nothing we can control. That's how we receive salvation. It's a gift. Well, it's that way we are to process everything, by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So if you're out there and you're thinking not too highly of yourself because you just made another mistake, you, you did a sin, you violated that, you need to acknowledge that, you need to repent of that and say, God, help me deal with that and be done with it. And don't let it deter you from going forward and being a part of his kingdom. Hallelujah. Okay. 
this uh, individual said, I'm trying to be better at reading my Bible and spending more time with God. Any advice? What would be your routine, for example? Okay. Um, again, don't try to compare yourself to anybody or do it, but I know it's helpful sometimes to hear people that you might, you know, be aspiring to be like or whatever. So for me, what I have done the last about 20 years is I put a time early in the morning that I am up before my wife. Um, and it may be easier for me because I was raised this way, but I get up about 4 to 4.30 most days. I go to bed around 10, 10.30. And um, for the last about 20 years, that's been my routine. And so because I'm up a few hours before the others in my home, um, I can't say enough about quiet time. I just can't say enough about quiet time. I mean, I mean if, if, if whoever asked this or anybody, I, I think... You know, if you see something that you would like to maybe change in your life to get more like my life, get up early. Have quiet time with God. I have quiet time with God. I just have quiet time with God. I, I read the Bible a lot. I'm not telling you. I don't read it daily. I don't follow those routines. I do a lot of reading of... Uh, Christians. I do a lot of books that I read. I, uh, I exercise my brain that way. Um, I pray a lot, but maybe not in the traditional way where people think you have to be on your knees or, um, you know, speaking out. Because I, I, I spend quiet time, I like to be outside. I go for walks. I'm doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one talking to God and just being quiet, listening. Just being quiet, looking at things, looking at the sky, looking at feeling the breeze. I just do a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, and I think there's a lot that goes along with what Jesus said. He'd get away from everybody. He'd get away. He'd just go away. He'd They'd be here, he'd get away and go on a hill, a cliffside. He'd go by a mountain, it said. He'd get up on the hill. He'd go away. He'd go away from the guys. He'd send them on their way. He'd go his way. Then he'd come up to them. I mean, he just would get away. I think there's, I, think, I don't think it's that complicated. And so, but in our culture, it's way more challenging because of the distractions we have. And the systems we've built up the, the relationships we've, been, we've built up, and a lot of those tendencies we've developed have made routines and lifestyles that if you actually begin doing something like I'm talking about, there will likely be an individual or individuals that will question why you're doing that. So, I hope that answers your question. I mean, I just think you need to have quiet time. I, need, I think you need to spend time in his word. I, need, I think you need to have time um, where you're dialoguing with God, where you're speaking, as well as listening. It doesn't need to be, be in a specific type of atmosphere that you think you've been told. I think you can do it um, walking and being outside or being in whatever kind of environment you like yourself. I just think you need to do it because God made you the way he made you and you need to not apologize for that but you need to find something that works for you but you need to be alone with God is probably the most important thing that's, that's what I want you to take away from that I'm not sure why we celebrate daylight savings time. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, this is an interesting one. This says, Growing up, I was taught God will forgive anything as long as you repent with the right heart. However, that means suicide victims will go to hell. Is there any scripture, or what do you believe about this? Well, there, there isn't really specifically any scripture. I've, I've heard a lot of really good, excellent teachers talk about this. This is, for me, one of those kinds of issues that, you know, you don't want to take life that way. Um, this is one of those scriptures where I would never en encourage anybody to uh, partake in that. God gave life. I mean, it's kind of like the ultimate slap in his face. However, I don't know about you, but I can't figure out the grace of God. I, I can't figure it out. And, um, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, different situations in humanity where people kind of, uh, their mental state isn't the same as everybody's, and they might do some things and not even know they're doing it. And I don't think they're going to be held to the same kind of standards that those of us that actually know what we're doing and have a deceitful heart and all those kinds of things, and then think we're going to get away with it. So I kind of put that in the category of it, and, and again, I... I have looked for scriptures about suicide and I have seen some or I've read and listened to some teaching about it through my life. Um, I can only tell you what I've done with people that I've run into that have told me that they're considering that. I've spent time with them to encourage them to be here another day and we'll deal with tomorrow when it gets here and you know call me so that's worked for me because I've had people come to me that I've been able to dialogue with to not take the greatest gift God gave you which is life I just I just don't think there's a lot of wisdom in us being real judgmental and shaming people after that or getting on family and getting into that dialogue I think there's much more fruit in trying to help the next person not follow that procedure. So I hope that helps. Okay, talked about that. Okay. Oh, okay. <coughs> In Numbers, in the book of Numbers, why does God tell Balaam to go to Balak but then blocks the way? <laughs> You're talking about the donkey. Um, well, I think, I think God can do whatever he wants. And I just think it's trying to show us another aspect of him of, you know, <laughs> obedience and lack thereof. And just showing things and, you know, I just... I just think too many times we're looking for a cut and dry answer and it's, <laughs> you just say it's because it's God, you know, because God can't figure it out many times. It's just called obedience, it's called faith, it's called trusting in Him. And sometimes our own, our own minds get us in trouble because we, if we can't figure it out, then we, we kind of mess things up and come up with a reason that we, it works for us and we kind of get off God's path. And I think many times... You'll see that happen in the Bible. I mean, I, I'm thinking of one immediately with that, that question that comes to me is Joshua and the Jews and the Hebrews coming into the promised land. I mean, it's one of the greatest triumphs ever of the Jews. They come into the promised land in Jericho, and their obedience there is unparalleled. They obeyed. They didn't do a thing other than what Joshua told them to do, what God told Joshua. They obeyed. They kept their mouth shut. I mean, think about that. For a whole week, they'd walk around that and not a peep until the seventh day and the seventh time they were told to let loose. And they do. They have this huge victory. The walls come down. They gather all the spoils. The very next thing they have to do, the next city... 
is, yeah, they have to go. And what do they do? This is like trying to compare to show. Some of the people tell Joshua, only 3,000 have to go. Now, up to this point, it was all of them. God hadn't given Joshua, and nothing had changed. So these people go and make the decision and say, Joshua, we checked it out. Oh, my gosh, we only need 3,000. Where God's been saying, I want the whole gang in this. I want total obedience. So they go do it. Of course, they get defeated bad. Like Only like, I think, three dozen are killed. And Joshua finds out, and he's on his knees. He's ripping his clothes. The elders of, of, with him are ripping their clothes, throwing sand on their face, sands on, sand on their head. He starts lamenting to God, Joshua does, why did you do this? Why are you having us here if this is what's going to happen? And they didn't even know yet that Achan had sinned. That's us. Many times we don't even know what's going on and we're not even obeying the way we're supposed to and then God's going to double down on us going, we're not even doing that right and then you didn't do this. It's the same thing with this kind of thing with Balak here and the donkey and Balaam. And I think we got to remember we just need to obey. And too many times we don't. We just, we just don't. All right. Okay, let's see. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts on Bible versions that are translated thought for thought rather than word for word? Well, that's a sticky one. Um, I tell you, there's there's some Bible versions out there that have really twisted what the original Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic meanings are, folks. There really are. Um, Some that are being translated here in the last couple of decades are, I know they might be really popular, but what they really have done, I'm just since you're asking you know, my opinion and I'm up here giving it, what they've really done is attached our feelings more than facts and the Word of God to make it a little sweeter, a little bit more, you know, the spoonful of sugar kind of thing. And in that process, we kind of miss what the true meaning is kind of chipping away at it through the, the different versions. Now, now listen, I'm not saying that the King James Version only. In fact, I've done a lot of research on this. There are a lot of mistakes in a lot of different Bible versions. There are. There are things omitted, deleted. That's why I've spent the time I've been doing this, I spend a lot of time researching the Hebrew meaning, the Greek meaning, and the Aramaic meaning of these words, and dig into, and I, I don't just take the word of somebody I even trust. I get in and do the research, because you can do your own research. I go to the Hebrew Institute, I'll go to different, and I'm not saying that they're the final say, I just... The way to test Scripture is you test Scripture with other Scripture. You, you can't, and, and a lot of times people will pick and choose a Scripture to get a narrative that aligns with their feelings because they are upset about something. But it has to align with Scripture and the theme throughout the Word of God. The old is the new contained, and the new is the old explained. So... I just caution you um, on, you know, be wise about this and, and read the word, but be careful if you even go, wait, does that, that doesn't sound like what I've heard. Well, then you should probably do some research. 
to find out what the true theme of that is, and it should be tied into the thread going on throughout the Bible. And again, it's all about good versus evil. There's this, you know, there's this creator and this individual, the Satan, that wants to play God. He wants to be worshipped. And God said, nope, I am. I'm the one to be worshipped. So there's this battle been going on all this time, and it's still going on. And we're like the, the pawns in there, and God's like, I am created you to be in my image and to have a will, free will. You get to make the choice. I won't force you. He's going to try to force you. That's the deal. Okay. <clears throat> All right. This is, uh, I hope I can get this right. Okay. How do you learn how to understand the purpose God is using you for if you are always doing the things He asks without knowing the reason, but not? to understand so I will be recognized, just to understand the calling on my life. I think, I think what somebody, what this is saying is, how am I to know that I'm doing the will of God and I also don't want to be recognized for doing the will of God? Well, this, this involves people. So one of the things is like here at, at any ministry, there are people in positions of authority, just like in any entity. In a family, it's mother and father. Okay? In a business, you'll have the boss, the workers, any organization. The same with the church of God. There'll be people in authority. One of the things that has that how this works properly is the authority figures will should be encouraging everyone to be taught, trained, and equipped to do the work of the ministry, to have opportunities to do the work of the ministry. Now, in that process, there are opportunities that you could be, uh, you know, not sure if this is what you're supposed to do. So, one of, what we do here is we give you a spiritual gift test. We want to find out what you think God has gifted you with. Then, once we identify those things that you've mentioned you believe you're spiritually gifted in, we want to give you the opportunity to exercise those giftings in this ministry. It's what Paul talked about in Ephesians. The entire body jointly fits together. So we want you all to fit together. We don't want you just to come here and hold a seat down and never get involved in the family. That would be similar to parents would understand this, that your children would never clean up after themselves. And I know that's not how we teach our kids. We teach them as, as they grow, as you start getting comfortable here, then you'll get opportunities and we should be encouraged to get opportunities to participate. And guess what happens? Sometimes you drop the plate. Sometimes you spilled your milk. Right? You get what I'm saying? Sometimes you'll make mistakes. You're human. And then we, like, pick up the pieces. We go, come on now. Okay, what did we, did we learn anything of what we did? Did we set you up wrong? Is this not a gift of yours? Whatever. And we work that through, and hopefully you're going, wait, this is how this works? Yes, this is how this works. And it becomes, at times, a little messy. can be uncomfortable. The thing that we hope you do here is that you don't allow fear of whatever's happened in your past to prevent you from getting plugged in here and start working, getting involved, using your gifts. That's only when, that, only when you do that, only when you do that are you going to actually feel like you're a part of what God's got for you. And guess what? If you make a mistake on your gift, big deal. Isn't there enough grace of God to cover that? Right? Right? Amen. So I'm going to ask the band to make their way up here. I'm going to get one more or two here. Wow, how do you encourage someone to forgive and let go if they're not saved? Well, 
<sighs> you got to show them. You got to walk the walk. You can tell them all day long, right? They usually don't listen to that. They walk, but but they'll they'll watch because of your witness. Your witness. That is the you know at all times preach the gospel and if necessary use words. It's the witness that they're going to see you, you know, maybe you made a mistake, you apologize for it, somebody wronged you, maybe that person wronged you, and you go up to them and you forgive them, and, and you don't make a big deal of it. You just go, hey, man, I'm, I forgive you, it's okay, you know, we make mistakes. And that in itself might be the very thing that is intriguing to them to go, wait, 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 I really wronged you. Why are you forgiving me? I don't deserve that. And then you can tell them, well, yeah, we didn't deserve what Jesus did. He didn't do nothing to me either, and we really wronged him. It's just an open door. I think the best way to do this with somebody that doesn't know Jesus is for you to be the very... And I think what's going on is God is using you as the vehicle to do that. He's using you. That, that, and that leads to right here. Like there, You may be here right now. You may be watching online that you haven't received Jesus Christ. Well, he, he did nothing wrong, and he was willing to die for you and me so that we could have eternal life. It's amazing. It's a free gift. So I encourage you to, to ask God to come into your heart. Ask for Jesus Christ, that you accept him, that you believe in him, that you're hungry to learn more about him that will save you for eternity so you don't go to this fiery place for eternity, but rather live with your creator for eternity. The altar team will be up here to pray with you. So I hope the things you heard tonight will stir you to dig into the Bible be a part of a ministry, participate, use your gifts, find out what your gifts are, forgive, hallelujah, we do this all because of Jesus, amen.